Sometimes nature presents us these interesting little mysteries. In fact, when you think about it, it's really more than some time. To this very day, we in the realm of science are still struggling not only to figure out how nature creates its discrete little mysteries, but the grander theme of how they all fit together. But among those unique little mysteries, those discrete mysteries, I think one of the most interesting, fascinating, is the story of the lost scent of a little flower that originally came from perhaps the northwestern side of North America. Now that little flower has long since been naturalized to many places, and it's now found in eastern North America, ranging from, oh, about the middle of the eastern coast of the USA, right up into Canada, at least as far as Nova Scotia, and perhaps up into Newfoundland. I've even seen it in the mountains out west, but not all the way to the coast. And in Europe, it can be found from the UK and through France and other parts. The flower itself is Erythronthra moscata, otherwise known as the musk monkey flower. And here in Maritime Canada, it is an unusual sight, not common, but not rare. And one may often find it among forest breaks or along the sides of old dirt roads, any place where a stream flows by and there's access to sunlight. And the interesting story behind this flower is that somehow, sometime between the years 1909 and 1915 or 16, so the story goes, this flower, once beautifully scented with a musk that could be smelled many meters away, well, it lost its fragrance all of a sudden. But is that true? Let's take a look at the story and see if we can make sense of it. The story is listed in the July 14, 1934 edition of Nature as a mere letter brought to the editor's attention. It's called The Lost Fragrance of Musk. I'll just cite it. The total disappearance within recent years of the scent of musk, Mamutus muscatus douglas, now that was its name at the time, the genus has since been changed to Erythronthe muscata, is one of the most puzzling of plant phenomena. A native of North America, it was introduced into Great Britain from British Columbia in 1826 by the botanist David Douglas. It quickly became a garden favorite, and the yellow, rather insignificant flowers are still a familiar sight in cottage windows. The plant has become naturalized in certain parts of the British Isles and in New Zealand, where it was taken by the early settlers. At the beginning of the present century, the sweet-smelling musk was hawked from door-to-door -door in London suburbs. So far as records are available, it appeared that the loss of fragrance was first noticed in Britain in 1909, when a well-known nurseryman asked, is there such a thing now as a common musk with the old musk perfume? Many friends of mine contend that there is not, and I myself am skeptical. Vimorin, however, in Les Plantes de Plantaire, 5th edition, 1909, describes the musk as une petite plante poilu et visqueuse, excellente une forte de musquet, qui se sent une grande distance which translates, it is a little plant that is hairy and viscous that exhales a strong odor of musk, which can be smelled from a great distance, which suggests that the mutation had not been noticed in France at that date. And there is evidence that in some localities, the failure to produce the characteristic perfume was not generally apparent until after 1916. Sir Arthur William Hill, director of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew around 1930, wrote an article to the prestigious Gardener's Chronicle, in which he had noted that the wild Erythronthre muscata out of British Columbia had also lost their musk. So the question is, how did this plant all around the world come to lose its musk? And in fact, what is Erythronthe muscata? Many people are not even familiar with this little flower. The plant can have upright to prostrate stems, that is, stems that lie on the ground. However, the eastern variety that I encounter always have upright stems. And it maintains a rhizome and grows in colonies. It is opposite leaves, which are oval, more or less, and up to about six centimeters long. When in bloom, which is much of the time, it sports bright yellow five-petaled flowers that are more or less two centimeters across. The flowers grow at the end of long tubules, which are up to 2.6 centimeters long, but only a few millimeters wide. The flowers are also noteworthy for their little red dots on the lower petals, which serve as a kind of runway for pollinating insects. And while the flowers are attractive, they are small and relatively unremarkable among plants. 
But at some point, back in the late 1800s, somebody came across these plants and noticed their beautiful musk. This was out west, up in British Columbia. And whoever that somebody was had the idea to bring these plants back to the UK and export them to other places in the world, like New Zealand and elsewhere in North America, to sell as home and garden plants for that beautiful musk. It was, for a time, right around the latter 19th to the very early 20th century, quite a popular plant, especially in the UK, where it charmed gentry and common folk alike with its lovely fragrance. But... This plant, with its unremarkable little yellow flowers, is today somewhat of a forgotten bygone plant of another era, having lost its favor among ornamental gardeners. Erythronthe moscata is an unusual plant that often grows, as noted earlier, uh, near stream sides. It likes to be near wet ground, so one can find it in meadows and forest breaks and alongside old dirt roads and most likely other places any place where it can keep its feet wet, so to speak, where it can keep its roots in the soil near a flowing source of water. I find this plant from time to time here in Nova Scotia, but only near clean flowing water. I've never seen it sitting around, say, stagnant ponds. Though it does like to grow very close to water, so it doesn't mind keeping its roots wet pretty much all the time. In fact, those that I'm portraying above are growing right up to the edge of the flowing water in this tiny little creek, and since whenever a heavy rain falls, that creek can partially submerge those plants, the plant is also well capable of surviving a deluge from time to time. It is a visibly remarkable plant because of two things. One, its pale green color, which is a bit different from most of the other greenery around. And two, as noted earlier, it is a very villous plant, which is to say it is covered with villi, which are small hairs that sometimes cover plants. It is covered so much with them that if one touches them, it feels velvety. Botanists and plant aficionados out west have also noted that when they touch the Erythranthe moscata, it has a viscous feel. I haven't experienced that myself, at least not with the eastern variety. However, the plant carries a lot of moisture. I would say it's almost a succulent, and it's easy to crush in the hands, and when crushed, it does present a readily noticeable viscous quality. In the early 19th century, the seed of this visually unremarkable plant was collected by the botanist David Douglas in British Columbia. A bit later, in 1828, a fellow named John Lindley grew it from seed in England and named it Muscatus. Lindley in particular noted that the plant had an extremely strong musky odor. And it was this musky odor that made the plant so popular among flower gardeners in England and elsewhere around the European continent a popularity that spread to many other places in the world as well. And throughout the latter portion of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, thousands upon thousands of Erythranthra moscata plants were sold to eager amateur horticulturalists. But then, at some point, we'll call it between about, say, 1880 and 1909, something began to change. The remarkable musk of the Erythranthra moscata began to fade away. And not in just any one place. It began to fade away everywhere. As I said earlier, the British had sold it as far away as New Zealand, where in those down-under colonies it had also attained a degree of popularity. And inquiries down to New Zealand also indicated that the plant there too had lost its musk. How could a plant lose its musk and fundamentally change in the same way all around the world at the same time? It is true that plants, like all living things, evolve over time. But across such wide geographical distances and in such very differing ecological zones, it could not have been possible that they would have experienced any kind of convergence evolution, all morphing into the same scentless trait at the same time. A number of theories have been presented to try to understand what happened. One is that humans had lost the ability to smell the plant's musk, which I think is just as unlikely as the possibility that the entire species all around the world simultaneously lost its ability to produce the musk. How and why could humans across the span of barely two generations and widely scattered all around the planet suddenly lose their ability to detect the plant's musk? I think we can safely rule this one out. Another theory raised is that it was not the plant itself, not exactly, but a parasite that infected the plant which caused it to produce its musk. 
This, I think we can safely say, is a more tenable theory, but also quite unlikely. Because we must ask again, how and why would the plant all around the world suddenly lose its musk, or in this case, its parasites? One might argue that moving the plant from its native western North America out to the UK and across the equator and down to places like New Zealand, in those places that parasite couldn't survive. But the musk monkey flower didn't just lose its scent in those places. It also apparently lost its scent in its native western North America. The parasite, if indeed it did exist, should not have quickly disappeared from even its native habitat. One idea reminiscent of 21st century conspiracy theory about 5G is that the monkey flower lost its scent due to radio waves. Radio waves were a newfangled technology at the time and nobody really understood them. Now, with modern capabilities to test the effects of things such as electrons and protons battering against genetic material, we know that exposure to electromagnetic radiation can catalyze the occurrence of mutations over time, but not that quickly. And man-made radio waves are so weak compared to other sources such as the sun that it's pretty unlikely. So unlikely, in fact, that I think we can indeed safely and entirely rule that conspiracy theory-style theory out. A few persons have even gone so far as to propose that maybe the musk monkey flower never had such a scent, and that its purported fragrance was due to hucksters, including something within the plant to give it its apparent scent, whether an oil or a mold, but whatever the case may be, I think that's also unlikely because the plant was quite popular for several decades and sold all over the world. It's very unlikely that hucksters at the time could coordinate in the sale of these fictitious musk monkey flowers for such a long time. And besides, why bother? If they had at their disposal another source of such a beautiful scent, why not just sell that? Indeed, in the case of this mystery, it's probably best just to turn back to science and apply Occam's razor, which is the principle that the simplest logical explanation is usually the correct explanation. And if we apply that theory, what does this tell us about the musk monkey flower? Well, as noted, the monkey flower is part of the genus Erythronthe, and there are many species within that genus, many right here in North America, where the original musk monkey flower originated. And the species is known to hybridize, not as readily as some plants such as mints, which are incredibly eager to hybridize, but it will hybridize in the right circumstances. It is very possible, and indeed I think likely, that the original very fragrant musk monkey flowers that were sold all around the world were the result of one or a small group of hybrids that had formed, which happened to produce this beautiful scent. It's also just as likely that a genetic mutation caused a small group of plants in a specific location to be the source of the incredible musk for which this plant had become known. In fact, some of the historical evidence indicates that the musk monkey flowers, which were originally brought over to Europe and then spread out from there, were produced from cuttings from the original fragrant plants. And thus those plants, being effectively clones of the fragrant monkey flowers, were able to carry on the scent trait for quite some time. As the popularity of the plant grew, and hunger for additional plants was created within the market, horticulturalists also took to using seed to reproduce the plant. And during the many decades the plant was extant in Europe, it managed to escape and become feral. And now to this very day, all around Europe, as well as Eastern North America and other places where the plant does not grow naturally, it can be found in the wild. Seed from more normal monkey flowers may then have hybridized with musky monkey flowers, soon returning those monkey flowers back to their original muskless state. I have smelled a lot of musk monkey flowers and never smelled any scent in any of them, so muskless is a good description. In fact, if the musk producing gene was a mere recessive trait, as the plant grew and produced new generations of flowers, which then went on to pollinate yet more generations of the plants, the recessive gene may have faded into obscurity on its own. The simple truth is, the answer to where went the musk flower's fragrance is probably one of those two things. Either it was a recessive gene that appeared and went with the circumstances, or the musky monkey flower was a result of some unusual hybridization that quickly faded away when the plant was able to pollinate with normal plants that were produced from additional seed that was brought in from the American Northwest. In fact, Guy Neeson, 
In 2012, wrote a paper on the taxonomy of the various Erythronthe species. And in this paper, Guy notes two things. One, reports of hybrid storms. That is, reports of the occasional appearance of clusters of hybrids of the Erythronthe. And that there is also evidence that when Erythronthe does hybridize, it is inclined to retain its morphological form, that is, its original shape. So, some sort of hybrid may well have caused it to change its fragrance for a while, at least until the hybrid vanished, while the plant looked just like the original musk monkey flower. So, there you go. The, the mystery of what happened to the musk monkey flower is a mystery, yes, and a charming one in its way. And very likely, the simple explanation behind the brief appearance of this flower that I guess we'll never get to smell, sadly, is that its scent was the result of a brief genetic aberration that was quickly bred away. But who knows, given her druthers, nature, in time, might yet produce another musky musk monkey flower for us all to enjoy. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural history and conservation issues. If you enjoy the program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.